أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Our dearest viewers from across the globe Once again, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to our second discussion show here With His Eminence Sayyid Mustafa Al-Qazwini Sayyidna, thank you for joining us once again It's an honor to have such a guest on our show And Alhamdulillah, we are blessed with this privilege for today And inshallah, one more evening you may recall from our show yesterday that we were discussing the connection between Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to those in the West, the impact of his message upon the culture, upon those who reside within that culture. And today we wish to take this one step further. We wish to delve into this a little bit more, however, focusing on the youth specifically, because this was something that cropped up in our previous discussion. So saying that if I could begin with your permission, inshallah, by asking you with regard to the connection of the youth in the West to that brilliant man just behind us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ahli baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin. May the peace and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you and all the dear viewers. And also the peace of the Lord be upon Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. And we are truly privileged to be so close to enjoy this, <clears throat> inshallah, physical as well as spiritual proximity to the two holy shrines in Karbala. Uh, the connection of the youth to Imam Hussein and his message and his cause was really reflected this year in a very outstanding and in a very tremendous way. We witnessed uh, uh, a surge in the number of the youth who came not only from inside Iraq, but from the rest of the Arab nations and Muslim countries and also from Europe and North America. And, and uh, one factor that helped really the youth to come was coinciding the Arba'in with the Christmas time and the New Year so most of them, they were able to take some time and come to Karbala. And I spoke with many of them and they experienced the walking from the march from Najaf to Karbala. And uh, every, um, almost every single individual I spoke to him or her, they said it was breathtaking experience. This was a, a very, very truly unique experience that we never thought, we never thought of it before. Uh, we never experienced such such a beautiful spiritual attachment and energy and energy and most importantly they were describing the uh, hospitality of the people along the road they would tell us that people used to beg us to please join us for food for lunch for dinner you know for coffee for tea and of course, this is part of the generosity of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So, and I, I can see that uh, the youth, especially in the West, are really uh, embarking on a new trend, a new uh, direction, a new chapter in their life, in their connection with Ahl al-Bayt, and in particular with Imam Hussein. We did not see this trend before, if I would say maybe until seven, eight years ago, you did not see that much, you know, uh, passion. Really? Yes, you could even, not even see. Even amongst the servants as well? Like the no, no, no. I'm talking about the youth in the West. Oh, okay, yeah. Our youth in the West. You could not see that much passion, uh, you know, directed towards the ziyara. Probably they would commemorate Ashura and Arba'in and other occasions. Mm -hmm. But I did not see anyone who said, I'd love to go to ziyara. Very, very, very few. But nowadays, almost every single youth that you speak to in Canada, in America, in Europe, they say we are saving money. We are saving money. We could not make it this year. We will go next year. Even those who were able to make it this year, they are insisting that this is not enough for me. I'm going to get addicted to it, and I'm going to come in the next years. And this is, alhamdulillah, the blessings, the barakat, the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the visitors and the pilgrims who receive the honor to 
come and enjoy this beautiful privilege visiting the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wa sure, we're very fortunate as you mentioned the, the physical proximity and the spiritual proximity um, and I think what you mentioned really ties quite beautifully into our title that we were discussing which well connecting the youth to the master of the youth the mark one of the masters of the youth of paradise of course Aba Abdullah al Hussein and alhamdulillah as you've mentioned in the west there is this increase even on social media there's a whole buzz about hashtag Arba'een, hashtag Arba'een walk. Everyone's loving it, you know. Picture after picture, I found this mulkin. They were giving this service. And it's quite stunning. But taking that back now. So those who haven't been able to come, or those of us that have, and we're now to return, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how we see it, to our homelands. How are we meant to connect to this message of Aba Abdullah? How are we meant to implement his message specifically into our detailed areas within our lives? I think there are two dimensions that we have to focus on when we go back to our homes and our countries and back to Europe and North America. One is to be able to maintain this spirit of religiosity that we attained here and we created here. And uh, the end of the ziyara does not mean that it's the end of the connection. As I mentioned previously, ziyara gives a boost, a moral, spiritual boost and energy, vaccination for the rest of the year. So we have to maintain this spirit. I know many people when they come to the ziyara, they maintain their five daily prayers on time, salatul layl, tahajjud, Quranic recitation, dua, charity, act of goodness, act of kindness. But sometimes they think if they go back home, back to business, you know, they would curtail on these activities. That should not be the case. This is the beginning. This is the jump start. They have to continue on this spirit. The second dimension is that it's not enough for us to connect with Ahlul Bayt and to exercise our religiosity. Mm. We have to convey this message to the people who live around us. Some of them are Muslims, some of them are non-Muslims, some of them are relatives, some of them are friends, community members, strangers. In, in any capacity we can. Of course, we are not going to the non-Muslims and speaking to him the same way we speak to the Muslims. Yeah. But again, they're going to ask us. Some of us are students, some of us are, you know, businessmen, some of us are neighbors, friends. So we go back and people are going to ask us about the experience. Where did you go? How did you spend New Year's Eve, Christmas, you know, vacation? So we have to tell them, and I have seen in the West, when I explain to them Ashura and Arba'een and, you know, these processions and events and uh, mawakib and occasions, they really get very excited about it. And they understand it. The Western mentality connects to the spirit of Imam Hussein. The Western connect, uh, mentality, because it is, it is somehow a healthy one, still healthy one, uh, objective one, mm -hmm. and always searches for the truth and the reality, so it's easier for them to connect with the message and the spirit of Imam Hussein. Mm -hmm. So they understand it, and in most cases they say, wow, really? This is a great man. Tell me more about him. And in many cases, I've had some non-Muslim friends. They were non-Muslims. Actually, I had a friend who was half Catholic and half, half Jewish. And one time he told me, Imam, Imam Qazwini, I really want you, next time when you go to Iraq, to Karbala, I want you to take me with you. I said, why? He said, because I read about Imam Hussein. I made a research about him. And I fall in love with him. I fall in love with him and I really want you to take me when you go to visit. So they connect. So I think the second dimension of our work should be reaching out to others. Sure. See when the Quran speaks about the prayers and worshipping. He says, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ Not only you pray. It's not enough. It's not enough. You command your family and your relatives and those who are with you. بِالصَّلَاةِ You command them. It's not enough. 
It's like having tea or coffee. When it is tea time, let's say in London, English tea time, you don't drink tea by yourself. You sit with others. This is the enjoyment of it. When you go for dinner, you don't go to a restaurant by yourself. You go with your company, with your friends. The same thing when it comes to the spiritual food. Spiritual food has to be, you know, uh, shared with others in the company of others. And if only the person himself does the prayers or the dua, the supplication, the ziyara, the good acts, and the rest of the community or the rest of the family are not doing that, neither he's going to enjoy it nor they're going to understand it. So we have this message. We have to preach what we learned here. We have to convey it to others. We have to tell them about it. And also we have to encourage them and, 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 and ask them to, to come, sure. to come with us. It's, it's, it's good that if you come this year and I come next year, at least we can bring three more friends, five more friends. We spread the word and Allah will send it to them. The invitation comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, we're going to receive the thawab if we really encourage them and tell them when we go back home, we tell them about what we witnessed. We don't need to exaggerate. We don't need to create false statements. You know, we, we say what we see sure, exactly. Sure. No more, no less. We tell them how we felt when we were here. And this is enough. So they can also come and benefit. And inshallah, one day you will see this visit, this city becomes the Mecca for millions and millions and millions from, uh, of people from ar around, around the world. Inshallah, you can see it coming, you can see it building every single year. It gets larger and larger. I think they said Iran this year alone had 17 million visas. I mean, that's, that's astonishing in itself. But we focus on that religious aspects. We focus on the salah, on the, you know, propagating that further a little bit more. If we were to now bring this to something social based within the youth, something that they face every single day in their lives, especially in the West, for example, gender interaction, which is a massive one that's on the list. Just, you know, every single day they're faced with at university, in the workplace for the elders as well. How can we use Imam's message to assist us with the challenges that we face there? Yes, Imam Hussein's message also can give us a guide, his cause, his revolution, his journey from Medina to Karbala, his martyrdom on the day of Ashura, can give us uh, many solutions, provide us with many solutions, and it, it, can, it can show us the way to tackle Many problems, many problems. Imam Hussein's revolution was not only universal, but it was uh, multidimensional on all dimensions, on all dimensions. So we can draw some solutions from that. When it comes to gender interaction, this is, and I have to be very honest with you, this is one of the most difficult dilemmas and a crisis that our youth face in the West. Especially those who are religious, those who are Muslims and practicing Muslims. Because in their homes, in the Imam Bargah, in the Husseiniya, in the mosque, in the Islamic center, they tell them there is total segregation. This is men's section, this is women's section. You don't see each other, you don't interact, you don't speak to each other. But once they leave, while they are in the parking lot outside, you know, they mingle with each other. They get mixed with each other and start socializing. And when they go tomorrow, the, the following day, they go to school, to college again. You know, in the classrooms, they are sitting next to each other. You cannot separate them. When they go to the marketplace, when they go to weddings, when they go to other social gatherings. So this creates some sort of conflict you know, which one is right, which one is wrong? Are both of them right? Not to segregate here, but here it's okay to segregate. Or both of them are wrong, or one of them is right, and the other is wrong. And they come to us with many questions. And this is really something, since I lived in the West uh, about um, 25 years ago, yeah. 
I've been asked this question by thousands and thousands. Every city I go to, every state, every country in Europe, in America, in North America, this is the main question that we get asked, that what is the right thing? What does Allah say? What does the Prophet says? What does the Quran say? What does Imam Hussein, our Imams? We tell them that in Islam, gender interaction neither based on absolute segregation nor absolute mixing. No extremes. Those are two both extremes. Certain cases you have to segregate. Yeah. It is more appropriate for you to segregate. But in other cases, you cannot segregate. It would be hurtful or unharmful. Sometimes segregation is beneficiary. It's good for the society, for the individuals. And sometimes, sometimes it does not work. It, it backfires, actually. Not only does not work, it really backfires. And it depends on many elements. It depends on where you live, when, when, where you live. If you ask me about the Middle East here, I'm a pro-segregation. But if you ask me about Europe and America, I'm not that pro-segregation. Also, it depends on the audience. Is the audience mature or not mature? For instance, when it comes to teens who are, let's say, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, you don't, want to, uh, you don't want them to be together in one place, especially without supervision. Yeah. You can't. But maybe if it comes to people who are much older, much responsible, much mature, you know, maybe they can handle that. So not all congregations, all places, all Islamic centers are the same. I say it's case by case. Mm -hmm. Segregation sometimes works, for certain communities, sometimes it does not work. I think even in an Islamic center, if we make it in a way, if we make it in a way that it's neither completely, completely segregated, we're creating a wall between the two, nor it's completely open yeah. where they can, you know, touch each other and hit each other. So something in the middle they can see the speaker let's say and we have on the right men are sitting on the left and maybe there is a partition in the middle some partition so they can handle it because in the west women in the west are really deprived muslim women in the west are really deprived from receiving the right attention and the right type of uh, dealing muamala and the right type of dealing with them. Many of them, they complain. They come to me, many educated, you know, members of our community, the female members. Mm -hmm. They say, when we go to the Islamic center, we, we really don't enjoy that experience. First of all, we don't see the speaker. And if we see him, we have to see him through the screen. We cannot interact with the speaker, you know. And uh, we don't like to be segregated. We want to be part of the community, yeah. part of the congregation, part of the, the gathering. So in certain cases, it does not work. In other cases, it might work. It depends on the place, the congregation. There is no absolute answer here where you can say it has to be always segregated or on the other hand, no, it has to be open. Neither one would work. Maybe sometimes one of them works here, the other one works in another place. The other uh, crisis we, we face is that when we don't allow them to see each other in the Islamic center, they going to see each other outside the Islamic center. And seeing each other within the boundaries of Islamic center, it will confine them within the Islamic boundaries yeah. and Islamic manners and Islamic akhlaq. While if you don't provide them this opportunity here, of course they're going to find other ways. And these other ways could be very dangerous. Yeah. If, they get, if, if they go outside and start interacting with each other outside, let's say in a wedding, 
in a party, birthday party, in even university, whatever, that would be more dangerous. Within the boundaries of its Islamic Center, at least they know there are rules and regulations here. They have to observe them. They have to observe them. They have to respect them. This is a, a holy place. So I think we should teach them this manner. And it would take us a long time to teach them. And we in the West, in California, in America, we really succeeded a, a long, uh, over a long period of time. Not in one year or two years or three years. It took us almost 20, two decades now to train them, to teach them, to introduce this culture of being together in one place without a partition, but also respecting each other and observing piety and taqwa and the fear of Allah. I think the best partition you can create for them is the fear of Allah. That's the best partition. If, if fear of Allah is there, piety, righteousness, there is no need to put a partition. The heart should realize. There is no need for a physical partition. The heart would tell you, would send you the message, listen, you are in the mosque. Even if there are no cameras, even if there are, there are no senior you know, people in the majlis watching you, there are no elders, there are no teachers, but there is the, the, big, the big monitoring system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. We have to teach them this. And the benefit of that, they're going to be more responsible. So they're going to adopt this method and this tariqa and this akhlaq and this manner, not only inside the Islamic Center. They're going to learn it and adopt it outside the Islamic Center. Even when they go to school, they know. They know that there are certain boundaries. Yeah. Even if this guy is sitting next to me, even if we are going for lunch together, I know my boundaries. I have to watch for, my, for, for, what I, for, for what I say, for what I hear, for what I see. So if we teach them this, I think they're going to uh, benefit from it. And we really, re, we're really going to eliminate many of, the, many of the problems and the challenges that they face in the West. I just wanted to grab your insight. I just wrote down two things here in that last bit that you said. The first part, this is from a personal experience back in the West. In science, when you get to about year 10, so about age 15, 16, when the public exams kick in, you're usually paired up. And you have to, usually the way that they did it in my school anyway, was you'd be boy, girl, boy, girl. And you'd have to conduct an experiment with the opposite gender, be it whatever, chemistry, whatever it may be. People then would say to me, what about those who have been, like we mentioned, secluded, they've never seen a girl in their life, but they've been completely halal the whole way to their whole, whole life, and they've got to this point, and then they don't know how to react. So you've mentioned we build them up. We build them up inside the mosque, they instill, instill the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they should be fine. Then I would go on and I'd say, however, a social rapport is usually quite useful within a working relationship. A lot of, you know, doc, doc, um, Historical studies and academic studies have proved that the working environment needs to have a social aspect to it too. And you mentioned about going out for lunch. Mm. To what extent can that social element be implemented with one who, let's say, does have that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's gone through that training or she's gone through that training. To what extent can they then have that social aspect going out for lunch as a group between the experiment or whatever? What would your take be on that? Here we have to differentiate between two cases. One case where those participants, let's say in that dinner, in that social gathering, lunch, whatever, are all Muslims and God-fearing. So they know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. They already know how to handle it. But then if you have another case where there is one individual or two of them, they are Muslims, God-fearing, they know how to handle but the rest are non-Muslims. The rest are non-Muslims. Or maybe they are Muslims, okay, but they have not been trained yeah. in how to approach this, you know, this, uh, this subject and how to handle it. Then here we're going to have a crisis yeah. here. We're going to have a crisis. So I'm not saying, I'm not advocating here that, well, let's go for lunch 
and I know myself, I am strong in my belief, I am, my faith is very strong, my, but you are strong, but the others are not strong. Yeah. This is like when they teach us driving, they say, listen, when you drive, you have to consider all those who drive, you know, as, as crazy people, mad people. So you have to be very watchful. Yeah. Do not depend on the other driver. You say he's seeing me. No. Imagine he's, he's deaf, he's dumb, he's blind. He doesn't see you. You have to be careful. Take every precaution. Exactly. This is exactly what we have to do. When we go in an environment that mostly an Islamic, even though, even though, let's say I'm sure of myself. I have not done anything wrong. I know how to handle this situation. But the rest, they don't have that experience. Yeah. The rest, they... So... We, we cannot have one set of rule for all scenarios. I would say for each scenario, there is one set of rules. Yeah. I know, it makes sense. I mean, we're just, it's been an ongoing discussion in the community, as we mentioned, you know, it's so, it's massive, ultimately, yes. like we've mentioned. Yeah, this yeah. is a challenge we face. Actually, I've, I had many members of my community, male and female, they say, we work in a company, prestigious company, and part of my job is to invite dignitaries, you know, guests who come to our company. Yeah. We have to take them for lunch. And one of the challenges is alcohol. Alcohol, he tells me, or she tells me, alcohol is part of the food. It comes with the food. There is no lunch, no dinner without alcohol. What shall I do in this case? I tell him, well, either don't go, send a representative. In one case, he said to me, I can't, you know, we have to organize lunch for them. I said, don't go yourself. I mean, try to bring an excuse. Say, I'm busy. I'm busy, I can't come, I can't make it. Send someone else, Some, send someone who's, who's a Christian or, or let's say non-Muslim who can, this thing's for him is okay. But there is no, here, here there is no excuse. Here I cannot say, well, this is my business, this is my job, my position, my profit, my company, then I must go. Here we cannot compromise. Yeah. On this issue, the issue of alcohol, we cannot compromise. But on the other hand, if there are opposite genders who are coming to the lunch, and there are many people, you are not alone, yeah. okay, with that uh, person, there are many others there, and alcohol is not there, the food, let's say, is halal, and the conversation, it's about business. It's about business. It's not about, not about a private uh, affairs or your private life and my... It's about business. Then in that case, it might work. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people have mentioned in that example, move on inshallah swiftly, but just someone, someone was mentioning an example like that and there was a quick interference and someone said, well, how about when you're talking about business, inevitably they'll get to a point where someone will say, oh, that's like what I did last weekend. And then you start going into the private, not the private affairs, but there's... I think... Uh, the person should be very smart and intelligent enough to try to avoid these areas. Kind of, yeah. Avoid going into these these areas. For sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So we've I think we've gone into that issue quite well. I think if anything crops up, we'll definitely address it in future times. Um, I wanted to stay on that message of using Imam Hussein to inspire those around us. Which part of Imam Hussein's story, not only himself, but of course his companions and his family, which part of the whole tragedy would you say would be the one that connects to the youth in the West the most? The one that we should perhaps place more emphasis on? Would it be the story of perhaps Ali and Al-Akbar mm. or of Qasim? Which one would you say may have yeah. an extra impact? Yeah, absolutely both the stories of Ali Al-Akbar and Al-Qasim alayhim as -salam, because both were young. Ali al-Akbar was maybe 27, 25. Qasim was, uh, was either 13 or 14 years old. And both pertain to the life of the youth in general and in the West in particular. Many of our youth, they ask, why God created me? What's the purpose of my creation? If I am going to die tomorrow, let's say, then why God created me in yeah. the first place? I am bored of my life. I don't know what to do, you know. And many of them, unfortunately, they, they think, you know, of committing suicide. Here, they can draw lessons from Ali al-Akbar and al-Qasim, that life has a purpose. 
God created you for a reason. You have, you have a message to deliver. You have a message to deliver. And you should always look forward for the Akhir. In this life, it's not important how many years you live. It could be 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, 70 years, 90 years. What is really important is how do you live? How do you live? What do you do? What is your achievement? This is the most important question that the youth have to ask themselves on a daily basis. What is my achievement? What's my, what's my contribution? What did, what did I do? What did I do to my nation, to my community, to my cause, to my Islam, to my family, to my country? They have to ask this question all the time. And they have to learn lesson from Al Qasim when uh, Imam Hussein asked him, uh, How do you look at death? He said, If death is for you, for your way, your cause, which is the cause of Islam, it's more delicious than the sweet. If this is the if this is the incentive for my death, I would not worry about it at all. And this is what how we should handle this life. We should work and work and work. Whenever Allah says, now you have to come back to me, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm packed. I'm already packed. I prepared my stuff and I am ready to go. So definitely the story of Ali al-Akbar pertains very well to the, and they relate to it, uh, the story of Al-Qasim, and also the story of Al-Abbas, alayhi salam. Why Al-Abbas is so great, really? I think there are many reasons, but one of them stands unique among them. Abbas is, alayhi salam, is very, very, uh, has many achievements. But one really, that one achievement that really touches my heart the most, the most. He was so thirsty. Imam al-Sadiq says, his heart was like a piece of charcoal, burning, burning of heat and thirst. Like a charcoal, burning charcoal. He came to the water successfully. 4,000 people were there. You know, he brushed them off and then he arrived. And he arrived here where uh, Nahr al-Alqami, which, which runs underneath the, the Holy Shrine. And he took a handful of water and it reached here. Almost he would put it in his mouth. All of a sudden, it clicked here that, wait a minute, I came here for a reason. I did not come to drink myself. I came for a reason. And now I would drink and I forget the reason I came for. This is very important. Many of us, we begin a project, okay? And then halfway through, we forget. Yeah. We forget the, the, the goal. We forget the f final destination. Some, some people, they, when they go to school in the beginning, they go with enthusiasm. I have to pursue. I have to finish my studies. I have to do. But then halfway through, they leave. Okay? Some of them, they begin the marital life, the marriage, you know, with enthusiasm, okay? with passion. But after a few months, a few years, they get bored. They get tired. They turn away. Some of them, they begin a project, a business, whatever. Al-Abbas alayhi salam, he came for one reason and he did not forget that reason. Although, although maybe his thirst was not less than the thirst of the children in the camp. It was not less than that because he was fighting, he was struggling, so he becomes thirsty. But he said, no, this is not what, I know I have to survive, but I have a cause. I have to defend my cause. This is what makes him great, believe me. He has many victories, many sacrifices. But this one, when you sacrifice your life for the sake of others to bring them some water, you know, and you remain thirsty, who could blame him if he would drink? Would they blame him? No. They would say, you reach there, drink it. Good for you. But he said, no. My conscience does not accept this. Does not accept this. I gave my pledge my word to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to bring with this skin container, I'll bring some water to the kids and I have to fulfill my promise. 
So fulfilling the wa'ad, the covenant, the promise, remaining steadfast right to the end. These are lessons that we really, uh, our youth should learn yeah. from Ashura. Each and every scene of Ashura, it represents a huge lesson for, the, for all people, in particular for our youth. And I think if we really live this spirit, if we live it every day, we are not going to fail, we are not going to trample, we are not going to get bored, we are not, many of people are not going to think of ending their life and committing suicide, but they're going to remain strong if they learn these lessons. I, I thoroughly agree, I think just think, you know, then you start thinking about each story and each one has, like you said, its own lessons. I think there's someone that said that Karbala and the event of Ashura is like a university in terms of how many things we Encyclopedia. Can learn yes. Encyclopedia. Full it's, of lessons. It's outstanding. And I think just to, you mentioned our father, and as you mentioned that, I was writing it down, standing true to a goal. That conviction, that inner promise that you make yourself that you'll get through it. And then I put down to Ali and Al-Akbar about the loyalty to the father. I think that's something that I personally take away because it's so easy when your father asks you of something and you're like, Fifty-fifty. I'm not sure. Uh, the story says when Imam Hussein took off from one of the stations between Medina and Karbala by the name of Qasr Bani Muqatil, okay. there were 38 stations where Imam Hussein had to take some rest from Medina all the way to Karbala. In one of these stations by the name of Qasr Bani Muqatil, when they left the station, and they started moving. It's, it's a rest area, actually, a rest area. Uh, Imam Hussein took a very brief nap, few seconds, few seconds. He nodded down his head while he was riding the horse and moving towards Karbala. And then when he woke up, he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Three times. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-ali al-azim. So Ali al-Akbar came to him. He said, Father, what happened? He said, I just took a brief nap and I heard a voice saying that this caravan is moving and death is moving behind them. So I realized that this journey is the journey for Shahada, for martyrdom. So Ali Al-Akbar in this case, you know, a young man who's 25, 27, he should be worried about himself. Plus he's married. He has children, he has a future ahead of him, he wants to enjoy his life. So rather than saying to his father, oh daddy, let's go back then. If there is death ahead of us, why we are going to death? You know, in, in, in normal you know, situation, the son, if they face danger, would come to his father and tell him, daddy, let's not go. He came and he said to his father, daddy, aren't we on the right path? Awalasna ala al haq Imam Hussein said, of course, الْعِبَادِ Of course, by the Lord, that we all going to go back to him. We are on the right path. Ali Al-Akbar said something very important. He said, إِذَنْ لَا نُبَالِي أَنْ نَمُوتَ مُحَقِّينَ My father, as long as we are on the right path, we don't care if we die. We don't care if we die. This is the essence of life. This is the essence of our message on earth. We should not fear death. We should not fear the defeat, the loss. As long as you are moving on the right path. Because some of our, our young generation, let's say she's a female, she comes to me. She says, Sayyid, I am in the university, medical school, and I am the only muhajjaba. I'm the only one who is observing hijab. And there is a lot of pressure on me. I'm speaking about America. Maybe in Europe, it's, mm. it's different. Similar, I'm sure, I'm sure. But in America, really, in, in some of these states where the Mus Muslim population is not in great numbers, they, fee uh, they, they really face severe challenges. And she tells me that sometimes my soul, myself, tells me to take it off. Who knows you here? Nobody knows you. You are in a classroom surrounded by non-Muslims. American people, they know nothing about Islam. So what's, the, what's the, the loss of you? I tell her no. Do you think, do you believe that this is a religious injunction or not? Is it in the Quran or not? She says, yes, it's in the Quran. Is it mandatory or not? 
She says, yes, it's mandatory. Does this please God? Yes, it does please God. So as long as this pleases God, why do you worry about others? You have to remain there steadfast. You have to remain. This is what we learn from Ali al-Akbar, from Ahlul Bayt. That as long as I am on the right path, then I don't care about what people are saying about me. I have to satisfy Allah. The problem with us, we give up on Allah, we give up on satisfying Him, and we always try to satisfy those who are around us. Let's satisfy my mother here, my neighbor, my fiance, my boss, my teacher, my co-worker, my... and we forget about Allah. So this is another lesson that we learn from Ali al-Akbar sure. alayhi salam. Sure. It's, uh, again, they, they link in. They link in. They all, all these lessons link in. They contribute to that golden path that we, if we stay on it, we're secure. You know, we're secure. And we mentioned Hazrat Qasim alayhi salam. And I think we have a couple of minutes for him, literally a couple. So I think maybe we'll leave this one to tomorrow. But perhaps a brief mention about the various traditions that mention about Hazrat Qasim and potentially being of the marriageable age. And we mentioned before about the issues with the gender relation. Yeah. So perhaps is this marriage a way to fix the gender issues that we face? Let me say something uh, before, before I answer this question. The, the riwayat, the stories, narrations about the marriage of Qasim are not that, that strong. Yeah. Are not that strong because Al Qasim was only 13 years old. But maybe if some of them are right, it was, it was showing us that there is an inclination, a desire in the heart of every father and mother to see the wedding of their son, their children, their daughters. And the mother of Al-Qasim, Al-Ramla, since she was widowed after the poisoning of Imam Hassan salam, 10 years before Ashura, the day of Ashura, she had this desire. She had this dream in her heart. She wanted to see the wedding, the marriage mm -hmm. of this young man. And this is why, you know, we have these stories and these scenarios and people mention the issue of marriage, which I hope, inshallah, in the next session we can elaborate on that more, inshallah. It's a very big topic, um, and like we mentioned, inshallah, one we can delve into. But just to conclude the various things we've gone through, you know, we've been through quite a bit. I think the things that I just wanted to talk about in these various last areas was we touched upon the importance of taking lessons from each of these infallibles, from each of these incredible human beings who gave everything for us, ultimately, fi sabidillah. A lesson from each that we can implement throughout our lives in every single obstacle and hurdle that we face, be it in university, be it in the workplace, or be it in school, wherever we are. But we should also remember, as Sayyid said, that each situation has its own unique characteristics. Thus, we must act accordingly, use the brain that we've been, we've been bestowed with, and try and, try and match the jigsaw. Use the examples, connect it, with, connect it with the scenario, and ultimately find that golden path towards the way of satisfying and pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. Just like Abu Fadl Abbas and Imam al-Hussein did so eloquently, and of course, as did their holy family. And inshallah, tomorrow we'll pick up on many of these saying there. Once inshallah. again, May it's Allah an honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very so much for having us. And our dear viewers, we hope to have you again tomorrow at the same time where we will be joined by Sayyid Mustafa Al Qazwini yet again. And thus, please remember us in your du'as over the coming days. And we look forward to having you tomorrow. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.